Okay, hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to the first of tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, many of you will know Kieran through ETS or from the Architects Climate Action Network. Yeah. yeah. And he's going to be fabulous. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Kian. I teach at the Architecture Association. I am a structural engineer. I'm a teacher and I'm also a university lecturer. And I'm part of ACAN and some other climate groups, um, as I was introduced. And I get to talk to you about carbon. Um, hopefully some of you have filled this in. Hopefully some of you know your carbon footprints. I'm not going to take any polls. I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, but for now, let's get on to what we're talking about. If there's anything that you want me to talk more about or less about or anywhere you want me to jump to or questions, please feel free to ask them as we go. Um, so loosely, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Hands up if you understand how greenhouse gases work. Cool. Okay. I think I'm just gonna, I think there's enough doubt in the room that I'm just going to go through it. That essentially, so radiation comes into the earth and normally it escapes. If we have greenhouse gases in the way, that sort of radiation comes in and it, it can't escape. And that leads to global warming. That's loosely the science behind what we're talking about. And so. We, we can't really change how that works. We can just really affect how much greenhouse gas there is in the world. And I'm going to be talking about carbon, but it's really important that we don't just think about carbon. Uh, this came from the IPCC report, and it's pointing out that it's not just about carbon. We need to think about the other sustainable development goals. So we need to think about issues of social um, inequality. We need to think about ecology. We need to think about water. Um, and that's the only way, it's only kind of with a holistic view that we'll ever kind of get to solving this problem. Uh, this is from the IPCC report, the 2022 report. Um, has everyone, hands up if you've read these reports? Hands up if you've read any of the reports? Hands up if I'm allowed to swear? No, I, sorry, I mean, so basically there's three reports and they, I, this, this, they were politely put in this kind of order by a friend of mine. And they said that the first one was, are we effed? Um, the second report is, how effed are we? And then the third report is, who has effed us? And it's really important, the third one is really useful because it actually highlights buildings as a sector and then it compares it to all of the different sustainable development goals. And it's really interesting because you can see that buildings are involved in all of those goals. So directly or indirectly, what we design has an impact on everything. And we're going to start to see the consequences that we're, we're, we're living in climate change um, as how far that change is going to happen. And so this comes from, this is kind of an estimate of how much some of our temperatures are going to change. So for example, London is expected to be as hot as Marseille by 2050. Uh, so we're going to have a drastic change to temperatures, whether or not we change now, but it's just a matter of how much change there's going to be. The other thing is that uh, we need to, so I'm just trying to work out which one I can see. We also need to think about things holistically. So when we're designing, um, we often use metrics like BRIAM or the Rebus Sustainable Outcomes, but I've been, I'm just trying to point out to you that I'd suggest looking towards the UN goals or something like Living and Building Challenge, because there are huge chunks of this kind of discussion that get missed out by some of the other metrics. There's also ecology. Um, this is a screen, this is from the Global Footprint Network. This is the organization that shows how many Earths we use per year. So it's not just about carbon, there are issues of ecology and our ecological footprints to what we're doing. Um, in the UK, We've just recently had the biodiversity net gain legislation come through. So we're going to have to start thinking about our ecological footprints as well as our carbon footprints. There are other footprints. For example, there's the water footprint. So countries that are taking water out of particular countries through the processes and the products that they take out of other countries. And again, it all links around. If we start to mess with our water, our water is actually one of our largest carbon sinks. So we change the quality of our water. We change our ability to absorb carbon we impact our climate change. The whole thing's linked. The next thing I want to kind of talk about is kind of, we're already seeing some of the impacts of this. We're seeing that particular projects are getting shelved due, in a lot of cases, due to carbon. So for example, the Tulip, that was going to be a, a large, the largest tower in London, 
um, was thrown out, largely because of its sustainable impact. We also have uh, the huge debate about the M&S store and about whether or not they could, it was lower carbon to demolish it or whether or not it was lower carbon to retrofit it. Um, and it's clear that it's a retrofit strategy is the one to go forward with. Um, we, as a group, have been petitioning the government to, re to legislate this, to regulate carbon emissions. Uh, so this was ACAN this year. Uh, we handed in our petition to regulate embodied carbon. Um, with, there's a bill that's been read in Parliament. Um, it's currently stalled. It's been read, but it's not gone any further. But if it goes through, it would lead to a change. We would have a part Z. We would have carbon regulation as part of what we do. Um, so we would have this carbon being, counting carbon in our buildings as part, of, like, as part of business as normal. And there's a lot of documents and guidance on it. I put this up just to kind of show that actually within the last couple of years, there's been a massive, massive increase um, in the number of publications and the amount of people looking in this area and trying to explain how, how this relates to buildings. So one of the first things I want to kind of discuss is carbon. Um, and what it is is a gas. And we always say, we, when we're talking about greenhouse gases, most of the time when we talk about it, we talk about carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas. There are other gases, and some of those gases are even worse than, the one, than, than carbon. So we use a term called carbon, um, carbon equivalent. And what that means is that, for example, one kilogram of methane is equal to 25 kilograms of carbon. So the, Emitting one kilogram of methane is as bad as 25 kilograms of carbon. And there are other gases, so you have nitrous oxide, you have all the way up to sulfur hexafluoride. And sulfur hexafluoride is 22,000 times worse than carbon. So carbon isn't the only gas, it's a, it's a greenhouse gas, but there are other gases, we have to be aware of them, and we should always be looking for this E at the end of anything that we see. That E shows that someone is not only just thinking about carbon, but they're thinking about all the other gases. So whenever someone says this is uh, CO2 neutral, then that means nothing because they could be ignoring all the other gases involved. Anyone got any questions about that? Yeah? What would be an example of a building process which causes sulfur hexafluoride? So sulfur hexafluoride is made in the aluminium production. So if you chose to use, if you had a building that was CO2 neutral but had aluminium and they hadn't declared the sulfur hexafluoride, they could be under accounting here by 22,000 times as much. So if anything says CO2, it's not enough. Any others? Yeah. Even if it's recycled aluminum, um, you'd, recycled materials will still have a, recycled materials will have a lower carbon impact. And so probably, I'm not sure about the aluminum production method. I'm not sure if uh, recycling it will release more sulfur hexafluoride, but you just need to be aware that whenever someone does talk about any process, they have to say CO2E, not just CO2. Anything else? Cool. It's a really important thing to see because it's a, it's a really clever way that people lie about carbon in the world. Um, so one of the ways that I'm going to start to talk to you about carbon is through buildings. And there's a thing that we have called the whole life building, whole life carbon assessment. Hands up if you've done a whole life carbon assessment for a building. If you can't see this on YouTube, there's no hands up. <laughs> Five hands up. Um, okay, so essentially what we have is we have a system which breaks down buildings into a series of stages. So the production of the elements, the construction of the building, the use of the building, the end of the life, and the benefits and loads. And these are a series of stages that's in a building's life. And so we've cut those down into even smaller modules, talking about the extraction of those materials, the processing of those materials, the transportation of those materials. And so going through each of those stages is how we count the carbon in buildings. Um, and it's really important that we, this would be the kind of framework that we would use if we were, if we were reg if once this regulation comes in. A lot of the time it's shown as a really linear process, and I, that's useful, but it's also useful to think about it in terms of other points, like circular economy. And so you can think about it as the production of the elements, then the actual building, then it being completed, and then it getting to its end of life. And what's really useful is that if we can avoid materials going to waste, then actually we can cut out the demolition of those elements and also the production of new elements. So thinking about it as a much smaller cycle for circular economy 
also reduces our carbon emissions. All right? The other thing that I want to ask is, I'm going to go back. Hands up if you know what net, car, uh, net, carbons, net zero carbon is. Hands up. Yeah? All right. Again, if you can't see this on the recording, there was about eight hands going up. Um, the thing that I want you to know is that, there, that there's a difference between net carbon zero, net zero carbon, which is there and you can't really see it because of the yellow, and ish, words like carbon neutral. So there's different ways of designing. So there's a climate denial approach where you ignore climate change and just emit loads of carbon over the lifetime of a project. Then there's carbon neutral design where you emit carbon, but you feel bad about it, so you absorb some carbon over the lifetime of that project and you get to zero. But really, net zero carbon says we're only going to we're going to set a limit to how much carbon we're going to emit for our project. It means we're going to stay within the IPCC's sorry the 1.5 Paris Agreement. So not only we're we going to limit how much we emit, but we're also going to go to zero. So it's slightly better than carbon neutral, but it's not the end of the picture. Really, what we want to do is we want to tr try and stay as negative as possible, and seeing things at our design work as actually, actually opportunities to absorb carbon over their lifetime. So looking at carbon capture design, which is where we're aiming to. Go on. Is it possible to make a building with like, zero carbon <coughs> during like, all this construction? Uh, it depends on the size of the building. But I think there are buildings that can do that, yeah. It depends on your choice of materials, where those materials came from, the processes you use, and how you built that life of that building. So yeah, I don't think there are many examples of net zero buildings, but you can design buildings that are net zero. Carbon capture, slightly harder. We don't have, we, it's a technology that's in development. So do you have algae facades? Do you grow things on this facade of your building that you later then use as part of the building? They're all things that we should be looking at. Um, aiming for net zero is not far enough, in my opinion. Anything else? OK, so if there's two things you remember from today, you should remember that CO2e is what we're looking for, and also that net zero carbon is good. It's limited but we should be aiming for less. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is that the framework has just been updated. So I've just showed you that. But um, there are other stages that are coming in. For example, uh, B8 was one of the stages in the new kind of system, which talks about how the building is used. And one that's really fun is stage A0. So that's the emissions involved in the design of that building. Um, so architectural practices, engineering practices, contractors, the emissions of their offices are going to start to become part of the whole life carbon of buildings. So that's kind of interesting to know. The other thing I like slightly, oh, I sh yeah, I'm going to go with it. It's fine. The only annoying thing is that um, this, is a recent, this is a recent system. They made it. It's good. I'm kind of annoyed that they kind of have confused it with the stand with another system that exists already for infrastructure. So it's kind of going to be confusing for a bit of time, but that's fine. Um, yeah, that's whole life carbon. Does anyone have any questions about that one? All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is our personal footprints. Um, so whole life carbon is our way of understanding our emissions for buildings. Um, the other way that we can start to look at this is a thing called our personal or organizational carbon footprints. And we use that, we do that through a method of scope emissions. Um, and there's scope one, two, and three. So scope one is if I have some wood and I decide to burn that wood to get heat, that's my scope one emission, I burnt that wood. Scope two is if I give that wood to someone else, they burn it and they give me the electricity and that's how I heat my space. So that's scope two and then everything else is scope three. So this is often one of the biggest lies that you'll see is that organizations will talk about their scope, that they've gotten to carbon neutral with their scope one and two and completely ignoring scope three. Um, and so it's a really frustrating thing to see when someone says, we are scope one and two, CO2, CO2 neutral. And you're like, oh, that statement is full of so many lies. So yeah, does anyone have any questions about this one? It'll be fun when uh, we, start, we start to talk about the, our, the carbon footprint of the AA and actually measuring our scope three as an organization was one of the hardest things, but was really valuable to the process. Um, and if you are interested as organizations, there's a thing called science-based targets. This is a framework for measuring your carbon footprint and then setting limitations to it. So here's one of my favorite questions. 
Hands up if you know who invented carbon footprints. So for reference, one person put their hand up. Do you want to tell me where it came from? Oil it did come from oil companies. Yay. Um, it was invented by British Petroleum. They set this up as a way of kind, it was in the rise of climate issues, they came up with this term of carbon footprints and they said, we're doing our thing, are you doing yours? And they invented this thing as a carbon footprint. And it's a really interesting way that they've managed to make us feel guilty for the emissions of large corporations. And you're gonna kind of be like, how does that work? Well, I've got a diagram. It's not my best diagram, but here it is. Um, so on one side you have basically if you just had BP's emissions. So if BP was in charge, was responsible for their carbon emissions, they'd have a big carbon footprint. But what they've done is they've managed to make you, me, Giles, Tom, Sal, Mike, and everyone take a tiny chunk of that emission and say, that's my responsibility, that's my responsibility, that's my responsibility. And so actually that diminishes, that kind of says, that makes us feel guilty about it, makes us think that we have to make lots of change um, and make them feel that they can get away with um, with doing what they want. So that is personal carbon footprints. And so this is one of the reasons why at the start I asked you all to put up, your, I had a QR code or a website link to measure your personal carbon footprint. It's useful, it's important, but it's, it's not really at the scale to make the significant change that we need to eliminate to, to affect climate change. Does that make sense? All right. So this is another one of my bad diagrams. It's not finished, but that's what it is. Um, I want to start visualizing carbon emissions. Can anyone tell me how big a gram of carbon is? Actually, can anyone tell me how big any of these different measurements of carbon are? How to visualize them? Like, OK, I'm going to go, OK, so if I went with a gram, I'm start my hands. Tell me, if I had a ball of carbon, how big is a gram of carbon? Tell me when to stop. Yeah, I've got one stop at this size. Okay, so a gram of carbon is about the size of a shot put ball, if you want to think about it. So a gram of carbon is about this big. Charles, can you? Carbon dioxide, yeah, a gram of carbon dioxide. Do you want to take it from me? Thanks. Good, okay, all right, kilograms of carbon. Can anyone tell me when to stop my hands? Stop. Stop, yep. So a, gra a kilogram, this is really good, you guys are doing really well. A kilogram of carbon is about the size of an exercise ball, so it'd be about this big. And yeah, uh, so it's this big. Can you take this one? Right, okay, tons of carbon. Anyone, any guesses how big a ton of carbon? I can't use my hands, it's too big for that. Any, any guesses how big a ton of carbon is, is a ball? This room? That's a really good guess. Yeah, that's probably about right, actually. So the diameter of a ton of carbon is about 10 meters. Um, a kiloton of carbon, actually this is getting really hard for me to show, so I'm just going to go to the next line. So you can't really see it, but um, a ton of carbon is about twice the size of a, a double-decker bus. A kiloton is about the same size as Big Ben. A megaton um, is about three times taller than the Shard. And a, um, and a gigaton is about half the size of London. So that's how big these kind of scales are. And what's, for, what, what's really interesting is that people move between these scales like we totally understand what's going on with it. And it makes it really hard to kind of visualize the carbon emissions in the world, of companies, of ourselves, of things that we do. So it's really useful to kind of have a sense of these different scales. Anyone got any questions about that? Okay, so a couple of examples. Um, this isn't coming up as well as I thought it would, but it's fine. Uh, so, in talking in terms of grams of carbon, so for example, an email is about four grams of carbon, a takeaway coffee is about 400 grams of carbon. If you go up a scale, if you wanted to burn a kilogram of coal, uh, that would be 2.4 kilograms. If you want to have a cheeseburger, that's about 2.5 kilograms of carbon. So it gets bigger. To put it all in, to put it slightly in perspective, a tree can absorb about 15 kilograms of carbon a year. It's a single tree. Um, I'm giving you a single number. Obviously, all of these things vary. The quality of coal will change whether or not that number is bigger or smaller. The type of tree and the age of that tree will also change. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of where these things are um, for, to discuss it. So driving 200 meter, driving, uh, driving a car 1,000 meter, 1,000 kilometers, which is, I think, to Edinburgh and back, to London is about 200 kilograms of carbon. Uh, flying that distance is about 200 kilograms of carbon too. 
one meter cubed of concrete, reinforced concrete, is about 600 kilograms of carbon. So it gets pretty big pretty quick once we start to talk about building materials. The next kind of scale is talking about our personal carbon footprints. So the average person in the world is about 6.6 .6 tons of carbon. Um, the UK is slightly over that, 7.1. Um, but really, if we are to stay within limits, we should be aiming for about 2.3 per person. Does that make sense? If you want to kind of visualize that, it means that you need about 6 point, to get 6.4, blah, 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 blah. To absorb 6.4 tons of carbon a year, you need about a football pitch sized forest. So really, everyone in the world needs their own football pitch sized forest in order to keep doing what they're doing. And that's not really going to happen. Going up another scale, you've got current buildings in the UK, um, residential buildings, about 2,500 square meters. If you're building a, pro like a project, that will release about, at the moment, it will release about three kilotons of carbon. But the gui Letty guidance is aiming, should, says we should be aiming for 1.1 kilo, uh, kilotons of carbon. That's a huge jump. That's uh, something that we do as professionals. That's the kind of work that we do. And that's a huge amount that's saved. That's two kilotons of carbon. That's about 2,000 people's carbon footprint. 200, sorry, 200 people's carbon footprints just in that, that building project. So it's really important that we think about these things in terms of the scale. We can do small things like reduce the amount of takeaway coffees we get, but really our design decisions make a much larger impact. Going on, the UK emits about 417 megatons of carbon. So that's when we're talking about the, the ball that was the size of the shard, or three times the size of the shard. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense, um, steel production in the UK releases 10 megatons. So some industries that we have release huge chunks of our carbon footprint as a country. And then global pre petroleum is about 5.1 gigatons. So that's, we're going up from a fact, like global petroleum is a factor bigger than UK emissions. And then when you get to the far, far end of the scale, you've got how much carbon we've ever released. Oops, sorry, let me just undo that. Uh, so you have the amount of carbon that we've ever released, 1,500 gigatons of carbon. You have how much we have left, 420 gigatons. And we have the fact that we release somewhere between 37 and 50 gigatons of carbon each year. Um, so that's where we are. Go on, Brigitte. The UK annual emissions includes UK manufacturing as part of that. It would, so it'll be everything that comes that is within scope one and two of the UK. Um, this is where, this, that is a really useful question. Um, so some countries have been reducing their carbon emissions and they're very proud of it. Often it means that they've just been outsourcing those carbon emissions. So instead of things being produced here, they get produced somewhere else and we kind of get the benefit of that it produced somewhere else. So we have a lower emission, we still get the things that we like and somewhere else is releasing more carbon. So when things are reducing, you have to be aware of where the, like the boundaries that they're drawing when they're doing those kind of emission boundaries. Does that make sense? Anyone got any questions about any of this? Cool. All right. Um, but there's some benefits to talking about carbon and putting them into projects. For example, carbon isn't just a gas, isn't just what's causing global warming. It represents a process. So every time that someone digs something out of the ground, that releases carbon, but that was a process to dig it out of the ground. To bake it in an oven, that was a process that has the carbon associated with it. So the other thing is that it also, in really, has a cost associated with it. So really, if we start to think about carbon as a process and having a cost, then actually reducing carbon should really lead to lower carbon, should really lead to cheaper, lower cost projects. The UK government used to kind of predict or kind of link ideas of what carbon might cost, but they've stopped doing this um, since 2018. Um, but yeah, so really understand your carbon would lead, should lead to project control. 80% um, of the buildings that we're, um, that we're gonna have in 2050 are already built. So we need to get much better at thinking about retrofit. We need to get better at thinking about ways to make retrofit and use existing buildings that become interesting, because it's another way of reducing our carbon footprints. Um, and a lot, 
hang on, wait, well, that one was talking about the ones that are built. This one's talking about the number that need to be retrofitted. So it's something like 30 million projects need to, buildings need to be retrofitted. Their facades, their interiors, all need to be, have be improved. Um, it also has implications of how we can reduce the carbon at the end of its life. So hopefully you've seen this. This is talking about the biogenic and the more mechanical mineral cycles. And then we need to think about our projects as having an end of life and how we can design them in a way that makes their end of life much easier. So if we're going to use, um, if we're gonna have timber, we should try and use organic paints on them instead of using mineral paints that then make it really hard at the end of life to separate those two materials. I'm just waiting for people to take photos. Cool. Um, and so this is it. We can also, we also, for some reason, also seem to be thinking about all of our materials coming from this kind of starting point and the way they are, but what we might want to think about them is, what if we started thinking about the materials from another project um, in the middle of their life? What if we took materials that had already had two lives and we started to use them in our projects? So this is another way of thinking about those kind of cycles that are going on with materials. I also think it's going to be really interesting. I think all of these projects are interesting, but I don't think they, I think they're kind of, they explore architecture in a pre-climate emergency way. And I think that there is going to be a new form of architecture. I don't know what that form will take on. Um, I think the Bullet Center, although it's not the perfect building, it's not the most beautiful building in the world, but I think it actually talks about a new form of architecture. This is um, one of the, I think it's the only commercial living building challenge book building. So it, it meets all of those UN criteria that I was talking about before. It, has that issue, it involves issues of social equality in it. It has issues of water autonomy, energy autonomy in it. So I think, as a f I think this is the start of that new form of post-climate emergency architecture that we, sh we should all be seeing. And you can, see about, you can see from their website all of the different systems that they had to use in order to make it work. And it also means that we're going to have to start thinking about materials more efficiently. Um, that we might, we kind of gotten used to having whatever grid size that we want, but actually one of the largest impacts that we can have on a project from a structure's point of view is actually to reduce the grid to about six meters. So we might move away from these long span spaces that we've been seeing in this kind of um, postmodern architecture, and we're gonna see this climate emergency architecture which has smaller spans, less material, much more efficient buildings. So that is my kind of overview of carbon. Um, I, this is the point where I didn't put much thought into my presentation. Um, and I'm kind of curious what people would like to talk about. Because I'm happy to go on. I've got, I can, we can go through the different parts of car, whole life carbon if you're curious to learn more about that. Or we can go on to targets. Is there anything in particular that anyone would like to ask, go back to, or discuss any further? Yeah. I'm wondering. I don't know <coughs> if that's working. That's fine. Oh, oh it is. If I'm an investor here in London and I'm going to manufacture loads of steel in China to be used for infrastructure in Ghana, and with that profit, it's going to go to my Swiss bank account while I live the life of Riley in my Hampstead mansion, where do those carbon costs go to? And is there, do you think that there's scope for there to be kind of consensus cross country? That is such a mean question, but a really good one. <laughs> um, what do I think about that? So I guess there's different parts to that. So you were, you were, for example, you were talking about a global supply chain. And first of all, it's really, it, there seems to be some odd things. There seems to be this kind of idea that things are impossible and they have to do them. So for example, there was a whole, th like when you see the dates, sell by dates on food, that, there was a whole thing that said that that was impossible. It was impossible to label each piece of food with a separate sell by date. And then as soon as the legislation came in, they found a way to do it, dot matrix printing, really cheap, and they made it work. And so actually, I don't, global supply chains, people seem to think that it's impossible for us to communicate the carbon associated with all our materials. Um, and it leads to things like material, um, material passports, buildings as, mater um, buildings as material banks as ways of us being able to transfer the information about the carbon emissions of the materials that we're using. So really that, that data should exist with the materials that we're using. So global supply chains, you should really be able to work out whether or not um, that carbon has an, like the carbon impact of that. And 
in the UK, that's true, because we might be using Chinese steel in the UK, we might be using UK steel, and those have significantly different carbon values. So we already do it at the moment. So you have whether or not we could do that, that's one part of it. Then it's whose carbon emissions that is. That is an interesting question. Um, one of the things that does come up is a lot of the numbers that I was showing you um, are generally underestimations because there is this line of whether or not it's my responsibility or your responsibility. And so, for example, I think there's a huge one that comes out of a lot of country emissions is whether or not um, who's, in who's responsible for aviation emissions. Because uh, it's not in a country, it's in the sky, so whose emissions are those? So actually, I think that we do need to have kind of tighter regulation, tighter, more clarity on whose emissions they are. Um, and I would say that it's the person who uses it is probably the person who's the one who should be responsible. It should be part of their carbon footprint. Um, and then it means that you push, then that means if, if I was making that building, I know that's my carbon, so I need to have a way of, my, of that, that steel I get from China to be, have a much smaller carbon footprint. Does that kind of answer your question? It was mean. <laughs> that's fine. Does anyone else have any questions? Go on. Bringing materials from the other part of the world has a smaller carbon emission than actually manufacturing the materials locally. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Good thing I prepared. Bye -bye. Um, okay, so this is a diagram which shows all the carbon stages and kind of gives you a percentage of their impact. Um, so the manufacture of the of the car of manufacturing emissions typically for a building uh, is fifty percent. That's also the emissions that are released in the first kind of stage of the project. So these, up to this point, these are all the emissions that will be involved in the construction. So those are the ones that we have the most control over. And so choosing low carbon materials is really important. Uh, transportation is low, it's 4%. Um, and so that's why if I was talking about carbon emissions in transport, hang on, people are taking photos. Cool. Um, there are, do, 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 not this way, not this way, do, 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 do there. Um, so this is where we have to kind of hold that in mind. So if we're using materials like concrete that are locally sourced, sure, transport-wise, they have a lower carbon footprint, but actually, they're that massive 50% chunk. Uh, if we're getting European-sourced timber, it does have a larger transport to come to the UK, but actually, overall, its carbon emissions are much smaller. So whenever we're thinking about carbon emissions, often people try to make us focus on one particular piece. And it's only by thinking about the whole life carbon emissions do we kind of pull out these kind of tricks that people are playing on us. Does that answer your question? Sweet. Any other questions? Go on. Yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> Give it a second. Hello. It is working. Thank you. I, I'm interested, because obviously we're talking about building here, but an interesting area <clears throat> I've been looking at over the last couple of years, and you mentioned SDGs and ESGs, is where is the trade-off on personal freedoms and collective freedoms with how this is going to be applied? And also, I could keep going with a lot of questions, but how much centrally controlled is this to, to be successful, all of these goals? How much are we going to have to go for a centri centrally controlled tyranny? That is a good question. Um, I'm against tyranny. I'm just making sure that's clear to everyone, <laughs> first of all. Um, yeah, this is regulations versus freedoms. And I think that's a good question. Uh, when I think about this, I like to think about um, child labor laws. And I like to think that when we had no regulation and we had no child labor laws, we basically had child labor conditions that were awful. We had children doing work and it was awful. And we regulated it. And we decided that was a regulation that was worth putting in. And that has, I, can't, I, don't, I couldn't imagine the numbers, but it definitely has reduced the number of deaths and improved child welfare. We have the same kind of thing where unions have asked us to have maternity days off, to have days off, to have sick leave. These are all regulations that have come in that bring freedom with them. 
And so I also think that regulation of carbon is one of those. It means that when you're making a decision, you don't have to toss up between cost and carbon. The two of those are aligned, so you're doing it together. And I think that it then also means that you're, you're reducing, you're, by reducing costs, by reducing carbon, you're making the right decision overall. So really, by not linking costs and carbon, we're making the wrong decisions. We're making harmful decisions as it is. And by linking them, we'd make better decisions. Could, should I come back on that? Unless someone else wants to yeah, ask one. someone else. Yeah. yeah, I think the conversation shouldn't be about like our personal freedoms. It's about like the companies and, the, and even the incentives that developers have and that we're giving them right now is just to make the most money. But um, yeah, we should try to, I think, steer away from our personal stuff and think about the systems in, that we have in place. Yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree with that. I think there's a large systems. Oh, no, someone said this re recently. What is it? It's all systematic and it's all personal. Um, and we, could, you, it is, we will make changes to the system and those will have personal impacts. And then the two of those are always going to be linked. But I think sometimes we need to, I agree with you, that our focus needs to be on larger impact decisions. Someone next to you. Hi, sorry. Uh, just thinking about what's fair in, let's say, Go on from your question, different countries that in the world are at different stages, right? So if you, let's say you have like a to totality that governs the whole world, like what about developing countries? They're still developing. Are they going to be forced to conform to the same standards as developed countries? Oh, because I don't of course, like the de developed countries, they were in the past, they were emitting much more, right? And no, 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 you're right. I'm just trying to find a blank space. I'm going to go back to this one. Nope, not that one. This one. Um, you're right. There is actually, in most projections, that when people do this in target setting, they, set, um, they actually set much stricter emission limits on um, developed countries and actually put them into a carbon, they say they should be in a carbon negative position much earlier. And they, in the same way that you're saying, that it allows developing countries or countries that haven't yet, that need to emit more, because they, there are some things that they don't have, they don't currently have, like road, road networks, that they need to have an opportunity to have those to have a fair world. So yeah, so some countries need to go negative quicker, so that other countries can have a slightly more positive one for a bit longer as well. Over here. Um, I would like to move the conversation a bit, kind of away from. I guess personal emissions or just general emissions and focus on materials and what we build with. Um, because I think that the challenge to get to carbon negative is, is enormous. And I think that people very quickly can kind of completely freak out by, by it because the numbers never stack up. Um, and in a way, the options are very limited and they're very, very straightforward. You've got unstabilized earth, local unstabilized earth, mm -hmm. and actually what you can do with it. Uh, you can build walls, uh, do floors, you can do uh, plasters, etc. cetera. Um, you've got, of course, um, fiber, locally grown fiber, as hemp and straw, which absorbs CO2 and you can use it in insulation. You've got locally, um, um, perhaps copies grown timber, and you've got structural steel. I'm um, sorry, sorry, structural uh, stone, and then that's that's about it. I mean, it's kind of the options, and of course, where you quarry the stone is very important. Can be more than 500 kilometers probably away in order the, to keep the emissions kind of within reach. Um, so yeah, the options in terms of what do we use are very clear, and they're restrictive and they're limited. But you can't do it without actually focusing on those three, four materials. It's so simple. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. So what you were talking about was the use, the focus on particularly low carbon materials as your starting place. And that's, for me, that's why I think that we haven't seen that new form of post-climate emergency architecture is because everyone seems to just be doing what they were doing before with a couple of tiny tweaks. But really, it requires you know, a drastic mindset change. It's like... My foundations are stone, not concrete anymore. My walls are straw bale construction. My second floor story is a timber frame engineered timber joists. Um, like I have developed ways to use these materials and make them seem beautiful. 
Um, and I, and I, so I'm completely with you on that. Everything, most low carbon materials kind of come from three worlds. They either come from stone, like limestone or, um, or lime renders. We have materials, they come from cellulose, biogenic materials like straw and trees and bamboo. And then they also have clay products. We have clay renders, we have rammed earth, we have burnt bricks, we have compressed earth bricks. That's really the kind of palette, the kind of NA, a palette for a low carbon world. At the back. Oh, wait, I've got one more. Go on, do you want to go? One, one more, yes, please. Um, could you talk a little bit about carbon credits and carbon credit trading? Oh, my God. <laughs> this, okay, so carbon credits are not my perfect forte. Um, and so I'm not going to be the best person to answer this question. But really, but really, um, so just, I guess, to summarize my knowledge of carbon credits, the idea is that I can emit carbon and then I buy credits. And those credits either equate to someone absorbing carbon through the planting of trees or the reduction in carbon by someone, by improving someone else's production or their cooking stove, they release less carbon. So that means that actually there's a carbon saving associated with that. Um, I think that it's a weird, this is a weird one when, especially when people come to like economics and regulation is that at the moment it's a voluntary system. Like, the, if you use a high carbon thing, you need to pay additional of your own choice to kind of equate that. But really the two should have been tied in the first place. So that's my first part of carbon credits. The second part is that carbon credits, there's little regulation to it. So just like when, just like when um, uh, digital currencies, Bitcoin came out, there was little regulation to that. So there is in some, there's the amount in carbon credits, there is a similar level of lacking of regulation. So even when someone says that they've bought these credits, there's actually no way of knowing, no real way of knowing whether or not it happened, unless they can actually show that they just didn't emit those carb that carbon in the first place. So there's the kind of validity of it. And then I think, I guess, there's, there, is, there is a place for it. Like I think it does lead, there are organizations who benefit from it. It does lead to some particular projects going forward that wouldn't have. But I really think that they shouldn't be the they sh regulation of it, pricing of that carbon should be in the first place. Oh, who's first? Is it you first? I should not have stopped talking. Hi. Um, sorry, I guess um, it's a few questions in one umbrella question. I guess my umbrella question is what is um, part Z of building regulations bringing to the build industry? So, as I understand it, already in the planning application process, there's a um, lot of develop, admit, uh, submit um, whole life carbon assessments, or often kind of uh, recruited by the client team, so they would say whatever the clients want to hear. So, what would parts that do to that? And also, how do you, um, you mentioned briefly about B8 in the whole life carbon assessment and about um, the use aspects. Mm. So, I think with, okay, this is a, it's a bit of a convoluted question, but. I think when, when it comes to deciding whether to build a building or not, there's always uh, this kind of versus dichotomy, the false dichotomy that people bring up between embodied carbon, which is the production side of the building, and then the operational carbon, which is the use side of the building. How does part Z um, kind of goes away from that kind of, uh, kind of binary and then actually allow the building to assess things more fairly? So part, part Z is like any new legislation, it's a light touch to anything. So it is a light touch regulation, and I think it points to the use of standard methods. So for example, it'll point to the RICS document as its method of measurement. Like I, I have, it's been a while since I read part Z, but I think that's loosely what it does. So it basically says, we believe it should be regulated, we should ev every project should do it, and that you should use this me standard methodology to do that. So it's pretty light in terms of what that regulation actually says. Um, but the RICS regulation has now come up with that B8, that use stage. Um, and that's a really interesting one because if, for example, if someone builds a retreat center in the middle of the mountains and they say, we did this really low carbon project, but then every time that someone goes there, they have to take really high carbon emission methods to get there. They have to drive, individuals driving there. Actually those, like if they're doing that on a daily or a weekly basis, that those carbon emissions will stack up. So that B8 is kind of including kind of accounting for those kind of things. This idea that you could build a retreat in the middle of nowhere and it's perfectly zero carbon. And it's saying, no, there's, you have a responsibility as well. On, in, we're including people getting to your place as part of your scope. Does that answer your question? Yes. 
Is there more? Did I miss something? I guess I'm quite, uh, I'm, I wanted to ask more about um, how to um, how to not to phrase the carbon question where you're kind of shifting, like you're doing like a hot potato thing where you're just shifting one carbon from one aspect of the hot carbon assessment to the other and then putting them in a dual, dual mode. So when you're deciding whether a building should be built or demolished and uh, rebuilt, um, and when it comes to retrofit, um, the the assessment of operational carbon becomes a, a ret uh, as it becomes a retor rhetoric to demolish buildings. How does um, our upcoming and contemporary policies deal with that with uh, tension? Well, I guess I guess the point of that, Ben, is you have to do you have to do whole life carbon. So the same a lot of a lot of the times this is another lie that some people do. They say our building is zero carbon, but then they'll say it's only scope A1 to A3 or A to A1 to A5. So people will sometimes they won't tell you the scope that they've done. So they won't tell you whether or not they're how many of these stages they're including. And so that's often another way that people are lying to us. Um, so it's only by doing a whole life carbon assessment that you can kind of get this. So if you were looking at a project, you would, have to, you would have to look at different options. You'd have to look at a light retrofit, a deep retrofit, a demolition strategy in order to get to this. And just like most of the time, as practitioners, we kind of get a sense for which is the most cost-effective one, and we will push it in that direction. It's only by doing those assessments again and again that we'll have that kind of sense for these kind of projects as well. But we'll still do them to make sure that what we think is right and that we can show our clients that that's what's right. Does that answer it? Cool. Um, I just had a comment that I wanted to add to the carbon um, credit question, which is that buying carbon credits is really just booting the problem away globally and in time, so in time and space. It's quite often buying loads of trees, which will take 40 years to grow on the other side of the world, um, creating a monoculture without considering you know, what should be growing in that location. Um, and the other thing in terms of thinking about carbon over time, when we're looking at these figures of carbon by, by weight of different materials, the carbon um, emissions for concrete are happening right now. They often get smoothed out over a 100-year period, but we have a climate crisis now. So it, sort of time, time and, and location needs to be in the conversation as well. I'm, and I know you have been including it in the conversation. Is that adding it there? No, no, no. It's something I didn't, I didn't highlight exactly. But really, when we were talking about limiting our carbon emissions, that's, that, those two lines, that zone there, represents uh, like our emissions before 2030. So, like you said, the kind of the making of buildings, the, the burning of the material, the burning of fuels to make them, those are all those emissions that we're going to release now before 2030. So if someone plants you a tree, it's going to be much later. It'll be something like 2040 by the time that, that actually has an impact. So you're right. That is part of So thinking about what we can do right now, thinking about stages A1 to A5 as a priority is, is a valid thing to say. Thank you. I have a question about the um, LCAs. So at the end of the life of a building with an LCA, how do people make sure that those are being followed? Is anyone holding, holding people accountable? Because they seem so great and there's so many great ideas, but I've actually, I mean, I've read loads of them, but I've never read one of a building that has been demolished where it has been a successful strategy or put in place, who, who's in charge of yeah, holding people accountable to those LCAs? So, it's a good point. I don't think anyone is currently holding anyone responsible because we don't have a way of regulating carbon emissions, so we don't have any way of regulating the end of life scenarios. So we don't have that right now. But there are other countries that are doing a better job of it. So for example, like I can be corrected, I think there's a policy, a Swedish policy or a Norwegian policy which basically says before you can demolish, you have to reallocate 70% of the material. So there are places, there are policies that are making this kind of thing work. There is an argument that comes up about whether or not we our end of life scenarios are fair. So at the while we're designing, we have to already be thinking about the end of life of a project. And that's and then people say that that's impossible, we can't predict what they're going to do, but for some reason we also seem to be able to predict how people are going to be using buildings for 50 years and be completely fine with that and think that we, as a person now, can make that decision. So I think we, we have to do our, with all of these things, we do our best 
way of making something that's adaptable for the people that will use the space, and we make the building and materials adaptable for what will happen at the end of their life. Or in a way that we think at a morally that they should be used in the future at the end of their life. Is that okay? Cool. Um, hi. Hey. Uh, I'm just thinking that um, if you consider retrofit projects where the structure of the building already exists, how do you define the start point of the life cycle? Uh, if, if I own the property, does it start from its uh, uh, the, the starting of the construction before it was uh, considered for retrofit? Or whether if I'm acquiring a property which, which is already on the ground, uh, how do you define the timeline? Oh, no, I didn't include it. Uh, keep. Sorry, that's a really good point. And I thought I included that slide, and maybe I didn't. Back, back, back. Let's see if I got it. Oh, I do. Sweet. OK. <laughs> Here's another one of my terrible unfinished diagrams that you have to live with. But anyway, this is a, a business as usual approach where you have a building, it has a life. Oops, you have a building, it has a life, you demolish it, and then you have another building, and it has a life. Um, and as part of that, um, we also include, if you had to demolish the building, then that's part of, that's part of your responsibility as the, building, the second building owner. But really what you can do is if you have a reuse strategy, that building had an existence, and then it comes to the end of its life, and then instead of deconstructing it, disposing of all those materials, you can eliminate those things. So they come out of that assessment. And then when you start designing your building, you also don't have the carbon emissions of putting in those new materials. So it reduces your retrofit carbon emissions. So there's this kind of benefit to both the person, the carbon footprint of the first building and a benefit to the second carbon footprint. But then the resultant is an accumulative calculation of the old building and the retro part. So the kind of impact, the benefit of that is what's put in this module D, this um, boop, boop, boop. Uh, no, the, which is the reuse recovery potential. So at the end of it, so when you design your building, and if you make everything deconstructible, demountable, you get to have a really high module D, which is separate, but it's still really useful to see, look, at the end of the life, my building is reusable. And so the first person who did that gets the value of that D, and they can show that, that module D, and the same as the, the second owner. They can say, my building is still really reusable, deconstructible, um, and low impact. I've got, I can ask one, I can one more person, one more question. Over there. Hi, so my question is concerning the materials that we harvest from the land. So we, we move all the carbon from one place to another place, but what happens to, what is, is there any solutions that we can, you know, implement um, concerning, let's say like we mine from the ground for the rocks and stuff like that. Yep. Um, is there anything that we can do to kind of repay the debt? of carbon costs yeah, on that actual land. Yeah. So those, those are two, and I, this is an interesting one. So this comes back to mining out a, like a kilo of, a meter cubed of stone has a carbon emissions to it, right? That stone leaves that site and goes somewhere else and lives somewhere else probably for the rest of its life, for the next, or at least the next 100,000 years or something like that, right? That stone, there's no way to really, stone exists in a geological age. It takes ages to be replaced. You won't, physically be able to replace that stone anytime soon. So we can't really, we have to kind of separate that. But the making of that, that stone, that's, that's with stone. If you have materials that are renewable like, or regrowable, like trees, you can plant a tree, you can harvest it, you can grow another tree. So we can, keep, we can keep renewing that place and keep growing more trees. So there's a slight difference between materials that can be renewed and materials that are extractive. They both have carbon emissions, and so that needs to be dealt in a kind of carbon way. But their environmental impact, their ecological impact, also needs to be thought about. So for example, if you take some land and you quarry it, you've disturbed what possibly was a, was a habitat there. Um, and so you should either, at the end, of its, the end of that quarry, you maybe make good and you return it to a habitat. Or you, cr you make sure that when you do want to do a quarry somewhere, that you've, you create somewhere another habitat somewhere else at the same time for biodiversity net gain. Does that make sense? So you kind of have to start thinking about them as like separate footprints um, in your thing, but you need to make sure that they're always on your eyes on the right side of it, I guess. It's a hard question. I don't have an illustration of it. So that's why it's really hard to talk about. <laughs> Is that all right? Thank you for asking. Anything else? <laughs> I guess just a response to that. Like, Right now, the remaking of that habitat is 
the responsibility of the government. I mean, companies can get away with destroying a habitat and then like just pushing the responsibility on to others the same way that when they build a building, they can just sell it to a management company and then the, the end of life is the responsibility of someone else. And I, I'm just curious, I mean, as a response to Charlotte's question as well, like, are there anything, or is there any systems in place that we are, or, or do you propose something to um, bring these um, responsibilities to the people that are kind of instigating these modes? So I, I think you need regulation. You need footprints, you need carbon footprints of everything. But you also, well, like I said at the start, I don't think you just need a carbon footprint. You also need to be thinking of the ecological footprints, the water footprints. And so like biodiversity net gain as a regulation is, is really interesting that it's kind of, we're not, we're not gonna regulate carbon, but we're gonna do this one at the same, that is gonna slip through. Um, so really, I think it's amazing if you can have an organization like the World Footprint Network who can predict how many Earths we use, who can combine things of biodiversity loss, of carbon emissions, of water use, of land use, and combine it into a single number, I don't really see any reason why, they can do that for the planet but I don't see any reason why we can't do it for a project and we can take all of these things into account. Um, I don't think, I, don't, I would not advocate for a situation where you've, 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 planted a, you've made a pond so you can emit lots of carbon. I think they should all be positives at the end of it instead of just like weighing out different positives and different negatives. So yeah, I'm being told that we have to wrap up there. So thanks to everyone. Um, <laughs> We're going to have a tiny break, um, and at 6 o'clock, we're going to have our second presentation from Charles and Tom. Anything else I've got to say? Oh, um, and then in the corner, we also have our display of climate data, which you might want to have a quick look at um, in between. Thanks, everyone. Thank